I want Thanksgiving to be different. I don't want the holiday that takes heaps of planning and multiple trips to the grocery store only for it to just come and go. This year, there's not a hug I'll receive, not a door I'll walk through, not a person I'll visit that will be taken for granted. I want Thanksgiving to be different. In times past, we'd say the obligatory Thanksgiving prayer, hold hands, bow heads, bite eager appetites. This year, I want to feel the hunger. The eagerness to thank God for what we once hardly noticed. A quiet gratitude in our hearts for all the small things God's granted us. Whether the whole family is together, whether there's one seat or two left empty, if our table is full and abundant or feeling the sting of a hard year, whether we've seen deliverance through all things or received strength despite hard things, we will give thanks. When all is well or nothing looks right, if we've gathered with many or sit in quiet solitude, by the grace of God, we will raise our hands to the one who gives and takes away. So I come to the table on this special day and give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. That is how we make Thanksgiving different. Good morning, brethren. We know that we're always supposed to be thankful. And we have so much to be thankful for, don't we? But there are some moments in life when being thankful becomes a little more difficult. Humanly speaking, from a human perspective, it becomes hard. We all experience it in one way or the other, in, and during this past couple of weeks, I've, I've experienced it with some issues and problems with my health. You noticed last week I was unable to to um, prepare a message for to be distributed online like I usually do. And well, I had difficulties. I still I still do. Uh, it's very very hard for me to see things properly. I only see certain things and, and not others. My, my vision is a bit impaired. Sometimes I even have some slight cognitive problems because of, of these issues. The doctors are running tests, of course, and they are, um, they are telling us that they seem to be ruling out the possibility of a stroke. They are now looking into the possibility of a brain tumor or other possible causes that would account for similar symptoms. But the, the point, the reason why I'm sharing this is because when we go through times like that, when we go through difficulties, then we think. We think a lot. It seems like our minds race with, with thoughts, like a river of flood of thoughts. And as we think, and we think about what is happening and what could be or should be or what is, well, we discover, perhaps more than other times, how frail we are. We discover how mortal we are. We discover that we are not eternal, that we are not here forever, and that we are really quite weak and quite frail. Life is here today and poof, could be gone tomorrow. But we also discover that we have many great blessings. Blessings that normally perhaps we take for granted, that we don't even look at or consider too much, but we should. We look at ourselves and we see frailty and we see and we, we find ourselves being vulnerable. I have been feeling very vulnerable in the last couple of weeks because of these type of things. And I would like to be more eloquent, as I, I think I mentioned that before. I would like to be more eloquent. I would like to be a little more, um, as you can see, not stumbling in my thoughts and, and in my words. 
But at this particular stage, those type of things are happening. And I think that if God has allowed it, there is a reason. But I also think that you are not here for eloquence. You're not listening to this, to this message to, to hear smooth speech or, or anything of that nature. I think that just like me, you are here for God, who is much greater than the sum total of all our weaknesses. Now, while many questions come to mind, the answers, for some reason, are not quite as many. And because the questions are many, but the answers are not, then we're called to trust. We're called to trust God. We're, uh, we're called to accept from God what He allows us to experience in full trust. It's basically what Job said. We, you find it written in Job chapter 2 and verse 10, as he was facing his own trials, Job made a, a very inter interesting statement, or actually a question. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? That's a good question, isn't it? Today, in our scripture for today, we meet Jesus, or better yet, He meets us in a very crucial time. We meet Him in front of Pontius Pilate, very short, just a little bit before He's crucified. And we read about that in John chapter 8, and verse, beginning with verse 33. Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to Him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth and everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. The setting of this statement here is very important. As I was mentioning before, we, we meet here, or better yet, Jesus meets us because he came to take our humanity on himself, and he did all this for us. But we find him here before Pilate, before a, a leader, a political and military leader, a leader of this world, who had a great deal of authority. And so you can imagine, here is this, this man, these two men, and the way they look, according to the world, based on the, from a human perspective, especially in front of Pilate with all his armor and clothing and authority and the soldiers and the power that he had, Jesus looked very weak. I mean, again, from a human perspective, Jesus, Jesus claimed to have a kingdom, but no one could see it. And no one could even see any resemblance of a kingdom. He claimed to be able to give life, but there he was, risking his life and just about to be killed. To Pilate, and perhaps to many others, Jesus looked miserable, pitiful. In today's terms, we would say a loser. But was he indeed? If you look at Jesus from a different perspective, if you look at Jesus as he stands before God, before the Father, you find Jesus triumphant in glorious victory. Not, not because of political power 
our strength like Pilate would want to have. But because of his immense love, because of his willingness to give himself for us, because of his willingness to fulfill the will of the Father, Jesus Christ won an eternal victory, a triumphant victory that still echoes throughout creation today as he is and will always be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is indeed the great I Am, the one who was, is, and will be, the self-existing one, the eternal one, the source of all life. But he did not look that way, did he? Now the key to understand this passage, and I think the key to understand us in many different ways, is right there in verse 36 where you read, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would be handed over, I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. This, brethren, as I mentioned, is a, is a key statement. It's a very important statement. The main aspects of that are very simple to grasp. His kingdom, God's kingdom, is not of this world. And because the kingdom of God is not of this world, brethren, we cannot go and look for it in this world. And yet, how many times do we do that? How many times do we expect to, to enjoy the kingdom of God right here in this world? We want God to do our bid. We want God to, to bless us in the way we expect Him to bless us. Notice what Jesus said. That he said that if the kingdom, His kingdom was of this world, then His servants would be fighting. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. As we look around, as we look at the Christianity today, we seem like, oh yeah, we are fighting, aren't we? But that is not what God has called us for. God's servants are not called to fight against one another because his kingdom is not of this realm. His kingdom is not a political party. His kingdom is not a political position. His kingdom is not even a military display. His kingdom is a kingdom that is spiritual and is a kingdom that will never, never, ever pass. And that applies to us as well. If we look for it in the human perspective, if you look for it in this world, in the here and now, we'll miss it. Just like the, the disciples of Jesus at the beginning missed it. His kingdom, brethren, is not of this world. And because of that, we are not of this world. We need to realize that. Sometimes we, we look at, at this world and we feel the need to fight. Jesus Christ said that if, if the kingdom of, his kingdom was of this world, we would be fighting for him. It would be our fight. And what would we fight for? Well, we want to fight for our health. Because if we're not healthy, then we feel like we, there's nothing that we can do. And yet, brethren, listen... Some of the greatest people I ever heard of and met and got to know in my life, the giants of the faith, as I like to call them and refer to them, there were people in great pain, people who could not claim great health at all. In fact, in most cases, their, their health was, was quite poor. We will be looking for that, for great health, because we feel like without it we cannot do anything. We will be looking for power, for the strength to do the things that we want to do, or maybe for the strength to impose on others the things that we would want them to do. We will be looking for wealth, because if we don't have a certain degree of wealth, numerous things 
a number of the things that we would want to do in this life, we would be incapable of doing them. And of course, all of that is so that we can exercise control, not just over our environment, but over others as well, so that they can do things and think and be the way we want them to be. Brethren, our ways are selfish ways. Our ways don't work. They lead us to ruin. I would like to share with you a quote for A.W. Tozer, from A.W. Tozer, a quote from the book, The Knowledge of the Holy. Here's what Tozer wrote. Because man is born a rebel, he is in unaware that he is one. He is constant assertion of self, as far as he even thinks of it at all, appears to him a perfectly normal thing. He is willing to share himself and sometimes even to sacrifice himself for a desired end, but never to dethrone himself. Sin has many manifestations, writes Tozer, but its essence is one. A moral being created to worship before the throne of God sits on the throne of his own selfhood and from that elevated position declares, I am. That's sin. That is sin in its concentrated essence, writes Tozer. But once again, it brings us to that key. That statement that Jesus made, my kingdom is not of this realm. Brethren, this is not our fight. This is God's fight. A fight and a, and a battle, in fact, not even a battle, a war that God has already won. Christ, Jesus Christ, has already won the victory. And this is not our fight, but His. And God's battle is not fought the way this world fights. God's battle is not based on the things that are valued in this world. There, it's not based on human perspective. God's battle is fought through love. By giving of ourselves for the benefit of others. Think about it for a moment. That in this world is regarded as a, perhaps one of the ultimate weaknesses. What do you mean, give of myself for the benefit of others? But if I give of myself, what, what do I get out of it? Well, you see, that's not the way love thinks to begin with. I'm so thankful that Jesus Christ, our Savior, did not think in that way. God's battle is fought by love. For the most part, it's a battle against ourselves, as well as the world. But it's a battle in which we are called to learn to give of ourselves for the benefit of others and to learn to love as Jesus Christ loved us. It is a battle that is fought in, in joy and the joy that we can experience regardless of our circumstances. It is a battle that, that we fight with peace. Peace not just for ourselves, not just a peace of being for our own selves, but the peace that we can extend and give to others by being peacemakers. And the patience that we're called to extend to others, the kindness that we are to exemplify toward other people, and, and, and the goodness and the faithfulness and the gentleness that we are to exercise toward others in self-control, controlling ourselves, not trying to control the circumstances, but rather controlling ourselves so that we can live through the circumstances in a way that is honoring to God. But did you notice a direction? The direction is not toward us. Love and all the other aspects of the fruit of the Spirit that we just mentioned, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, it's all toward others. It outflows 
from us, actually from God, to us and through us toward others. The direction is not ourselves. The direction is a giving of ourselves in love. It's not taking, but sharing. And the paradox is that the one who gave it all, think about it, brethren, the one who gave all of it, he gave all of himself and he gave all that he created and all that he has, Jesus Christ, God Almighty, the one who's really given all is actually the one who actually is the owner of all, the one who owns all things, the one who controls all things, the most powerful being in the whole universe, the one for whom, to whom, and in whom all things have their being. And brethren, even when everything seems lost, and sometimes in life, sometimes in life in our human perspective, we, we feel that way, don't we? We feel like everything around us seems lost. But is it really? I'd like to share what Jesus said in Matthew 10, in verse 39. Jesus said, He who has found his life will lose it. But he who has lost its life for my sake will find it. It's a paradox, isn't it? If you want to find your life, then you've got to be willing to lose it for Christ's sake. But if you're not willing to lose your life for Christ's sake, and you really want to find your life in this world, then you lose your real life. Matthew 16 and verse 25 says pretty much the same thing. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it, says Jesus. This does not mean that God takes away all that is good from us, actually the opposite. But it does mean that, as the Apostle Paul pointed out to us, that we are dead to ourselves to be alive in Christ. We don't live for ourselves, we live for Christ because it is in Him that we have a future. And as we live in Christ and as we live for Him and not for ourselves or for the things of this world, then brethren, what Paul wrote to the Corinthians applies to us as well. We find that in 2 Corinthians 4.16, therefore, we don't lose heart but even though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Brethren, that is life. Our outer man is decaying. We grow older day after day. And some of us get sick. And some of us get weaker. Some of us struggle to remember the things that we need to remember and sometimes we we have a hard time finding the words that we want to use but while our outer man is decaying our inner man is renewed in Christ day by day and not just renewed but made stronger because in in our weakness the strength of the Lord is made perfect now this passage also, brethren, tells us that Jesus came to testify to the truth. And the truth is not that everything is going to be rosy. The truth is not that everything is going to be our way. The truth is that we're going to have joyful moments and sad moments. There will be a time to cry and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. The truth is that we're going to experience life like everybody else, but we're going to be experiencing life if we are in Christ, not isolated, not left alone, not left to ourselves. Because in Christ, well, we have communion, a communion with the Creator and Sustainer of all things. And Jesus shared that and, and much more of the truth. And he did it by teaching, 
but he also did it by modeling, by showing us what real life is all about. Above all, he taught us by his example, by surrendering to the perfect will of the Father in full faith and in full trust and calling us to do the same. You see, our calling is now to try to make this life the best it could be because once this is gone, everything is gone. No, brethren, that is not Christianity. Christianity reminds us that the best is yet to come. Christianity reminds us that our life is only this physical life that we live right now is only a temporary moment. But God has offered us and has given us eternal life in His glory. But we need to learn to live it in Him, to surrender to Him, to participate in His holiness and to share in His life because it is His life. Remember what the Apostle Paul said, we are dead to ourselves but alive in Christ. He is our life. And in so doing, in showing us all these things, God has shown us the way to, to be, not just the way to walk or act, but also the way, the way of being, the way of faith and trust. He's called us to realize that God is faithful. He can be trusted and He deserves our trust even when things don't look the way we would want them to look. Brethren, none of us wants to hurt. None of us wants to become challenging and difficult in our life, and yet they are. But even though we face challenges, we know that God is faithful. We know that He can be trusted. And so we offer Him our whole life we offer Him our trust as well as our faithfulness and our surrender so that we can echo the world of Jesus Christ, the words of Christ when He said, Father, not my will, but Your will be done. The way that God has called us to walk in is really the way to the ultimate glory and to the ultimate honor, the very glory of God. Look at it again in, in John 17, as Jesus prayed to the Father before His crucifixion, he, as He prayed to the Father, he, he stated very, very clearly that the glory that the Father had given to God the Son, to Jesus Christ, our Savior, He has given to us. We are not called for misery. Our calling is a calling to glory. Our calling is, is to the greatest and, and the most amazing inheritance that we could ever even possibly begin to imagine. But we need to trust Him. We need to trust Him even beyond what we can see and what we can feel. We need to trust Him even beyond our life our very life, because true life is found in Him. Brethren, it's not about us, it's about Him. And if we look at, at this life from a human perspective, oh, we have a lot to complain about. But if we look at it from God's perspective, from what He has in store for all of us, and what He's offering even today to all of us, there's so much to be thankful for, so much, and even in all our trials. And we can sing God's praises, and we can pour our heart to Him and find His warm embrace, because He loves you, He loves us, and never, ever, ever, nothing will ever separate us from the love of God. God bless you. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, 
to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fail, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail, and there I find you in the mystery, an ocean deep, my faith will stand. Rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine. Your grace abounds in deepest waters, your sovereign hand will be my guide. Be my faith. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. <laughs>